So thank you for the, the very warm welcome. Um, I'm excited to get to talk to you today. I've really been looking forward to uh, coming to Chicago, but I guess we'll have to do this digitally and, and hopefully I can make it out to Chicago another time. Um, here today to talk about how it's always sunny with OpenJ9. So if we're going to talk about the sun, the usual other thing we want to talk about is the cloud. Um, and you know the cloud's been the rage these days, right? Everybody is in, into the cloud, is into migrating to the cloud, is into uh, moving their workloads, whether that's lift and shift or new cloud native deployments or, or whatever the term may be, right? We've got a whole buzzword soup about how great it is to move to the cloud and, and to deploy microservices, to scale things out and to live in, in a new cloud world. Now, I think the cloud's amazing. And I think there's a lot of really cool things there, being able to easily deploy workloads and, and quickly get new servers. But that's not always the feeling I get when I look at the cloud. Sometimes it's a little bit more like this. right? It, it, it's kind of scary in some ways. There's a, a lot of technology to learn. There's a lot of things uh, to figure out. And it seems to be changing all the time. It, it's this massive landscape of stuff. And it's not always clear what to do and, and where to go. and and there's an awful lot of technology to keep up on. So I thought, okay, I'll, I'll go take a look at, at the Cloud uh, Native Computing Foundation and see what their landscape and, and their set of uh, tools and, and suggested cloud things are. And then I found this. And there's an awful lot of stuff here to keep up to date on, right? There's service meshes, API gateways, proxies. You know, just as you look around here, there's an awful lot of really cool and really amazing technology. But it's hard to know which things do you pick, which ones do you stick with, which ones, uh, you know, go away in the future. Uh, you know, because you don't want to pick something that's not going to be around long term. And so, I, you know, in a lot of ways, the cloud can be overwhelming for all of us, um, at, at least for me. Um, and so what I've really had to do is, is figure out where does all of this fit? in terms of what my day job is. And you know, this is my day job. And this is um, courtesy of our, our friends at Oracle. It's from Java 8. It shows all the different layers in a, in a JRE and a JDK, um, you know, a, a JVM at the bottom, different API packages, different parts of Java, and all the different bits that have to come together that you have to have working. and, and um, that you have to understand, or at least I have to understand day to day to be able to do my job. And this picture has been changed, you know, modules have come in nine and, and there's new features coming all the time. And even Java is changing all the time with its six month release cadence, right? Uh, Java 15 is just around the corner with a, a load of uh, new cool features coming, but it's a lot to absorb. And that's just my day job and the tech I work with. And then there's all the tech and, and things that that all of you work with on top of this, your frameworks, your applications, all the code you need to deal with. So, you know, how do we make sense of all of this? Well, when I say my day job is Java, what I actually mean is my day job is the OpenJ9 JVM. And so a bit of background on, on OpenJ9, it was open sourced um, in 2017 by IBM. The code base goes all the way back to embedded Java and before that back into uh, Smalltalk roots as NV Smalltalk. There, there are still little tendrils of code that have survived all the way through that migration path. But it was open sourced um, at the Eclipse Foundation under very accessible licenses, the EPL uh, public license V2 and, and Apache V2. And it's a very open project. We're always looking for contributors for uh, committers for users. So, you know, if, if you are interested, do check us out, do join our community. But that's my day job is, is making the OpenJ9 JVM run well. And then I still have to figure out what do I do with this cloud stuff? And so one of the areas we focused on is rather than having everybody be buried in that, that huge set of workloads and, and that level of complexity was how can we use Java and the JVM to simplify your world? How can we make it so it's easier for you to adopt containers, for you to adopt the cloud, and for you to run your workloads in the cloud and, and uh, to run your Java with confidence and ease? 
So that's been a bit of our focus as a project. And one of the things that we've decided um, to really make that possible is to take our JVM and we build it with the class libraries that you get from OpenJDK. So it's the class libraries you know and love and with all the behavior you're used to, um, but with a different JVM underneath it, with a JVM that's really focused on making sure that you work well in the cloud. Now, one of the major things we did was we, we didn't want you to worry about, oh, I, you know, there's some new feature for better container support, but it's only in JDK 15, so I gotta wait a while to get that. No, what we said is we're gonna make one stream for the JVM. And so there's one source stream, and we build that same source stream for the VM with JDK 8, with 11, with 14, and, and we're currently working on building it with 15. And so that every release that comes out we're supporting all the releases you want. So as you go to look at, at a new cloud feature or a new GC improvement or a new JIT improvement, you can get it on any JDK. So features that are Java release specific, those stick with that Java release. So, you know, lambdas that came in eight are with eight, they wouldn't be backported beyond that. Um, but the JVM level features, of course, um, are available anywhere. So we, we wanted to make sure that you could get the value you needed as you made that cloud migration without being forced along that path by needing some better container support or, or some other cloud feature. Right, but cloud, not just how we build the JDK. So how do we make your life easy as you look at running in the cloud, as you work look at uh, how to deploy your Java workloads? Well, first off, when we look at the cloud, what, what's required? What does the cloud really drive? What behavior does it want from applications? And the first one is um, fast startup. Right? As you take your, your deployment and you wanna scale it out, you wanna be able to start it quickly so that each new server um, comes up quickly and is ready to, to do work for you uh, as you have to meet that increased demand from your users and, and from the, the transactions going through your system. Scaling that, you don't want to pay for a huge amount of memory. You only want to pay for the memory that you actually need. So you really want a small footprint out of your JVM because that's going to improve the density on the servers you're running in your Kubernetes cluster. The more applications you can pack onto the same node, the, uh, the less it's going to cost you. And if you're deploying directly onto somebody else's servers, then uh, you know the less memory you take, the smaller... Uh, an instance you may be able to fit onto. So we want that fast startup. We want that small footprint so you can pack in and get the density. And then we want a quick or immediate ramp up. And the reason for this is a lot of cloud providers charge you based on gigabits per hour, right? It's how much memory you're using and how long you use it really determines the rate of what running in the cloud is gonna cost you. So with OpenJ9, we said, look, a lot of workloads are being run in containers today. How can we make um, that container experience run well? And so we added um, an option, and I believe Hotspot has the same option, um, but it's use container support. And we actually detect that you're running in a container and enable this by default. So if you're in a container and, and the VM can detect that, then great, we will enable our container awareness for you uh, just out of the box. So what does that container awareness give you? Well, it tunes the GC heap for you so that you're going to pick the right size based on the container that you're running in. And I'll talk a little bit more about what kind of sizing that is on the next slide. Um, it also is going to limit the number of GC threads that you have and, and the active number of JIT threads. Now, the reason for this is your container might be running on a massive machine with a lot of cores and a lot of CPUs and a lot of memory, but it's been constrained using um, the C group or the container properties to limit the amount of memory it has access to or the amount of CPU quota that it gets. And so you don't really want the uh, JVM to pick and, and use all that quota up uh, running GC threads or, or running the JIT compiler. Um, similarly, we're going to constrain what you get out of runtime available processors. Uh, and the reason for this is as you go to spin up 
um, you know, a thread pool or something else based on the resources you have available. You don't want to be sizing that based on the massive machine you're running on. You want to be sizing that based on the resources you actually get access to. And then the other feature we enable out of the box is idle tuning awareness. So let's dig into this a little bit further. So on the bottom of this slide here, what I'm showing is uh, the way that we size the heap for you. So if you're running in a container and you've limited the, you know, the amount of memory that that uh, container is allowed to have, we will base our heap sizes uh, around the container that you're in. So if you've limited your container to have less than a gig of memory, we're going to take half of that for the heap. In that one to two gig range, we're going to take all of the memory um, minus 512 megs. And if you're running in a larger container that's bigger than two gigs, we're going to take about 75% of that memory for the Java heap. So this is actually really cool because it means that you can control your heap size by controlling um, the container memory limits rather than having to change dash X and X or max heap size options and have that control how much memory you get. Because every time you change an option that's embedded in your container, you have to do a rebuild. And so you're going to have to rebuild your container if you're driving it based off of um, a, a static XMX. So there's two other options, though, on this slide. Um, and both of them are really about being able to replace the dash XMX and max heap size and the dash XMS initial heap size options with something percentage based. And what that does is it allows you to control uh, how big your heap is as a percentage of the memory that, uh, that your container is allowed to have. So if the defaults that we've chosen there on that chart don't work for your workload, you can control that with these options. And then when you deploy, you know, so maybe sometimes on a small instance and sometimes on a large instance, the heap size that you're getting is going to be relative to the, the image that you're running on rather than something hard-coded or, or a cry, requiring a rebuild of the container. So the other piece I'm going to talk about here is the out-of-the-box idle tuning. And there's a study, and I, I don't have the link here right now, unfortunately, that talks about um, servers in, in data centers and how I think it's 80% of them are idle most of the time. Um, which is really a kind of interesting thing when you, you see that most servers and services are, are sitting there idle, not doing anything. Um, that means that there's a lot of time that the JVM can be preparing for when your application does have some transactions or is hitting a, a period of heavier transactions. So what we've done is we've modified the JVM to be able to recognize when your application goes idle for a period of time. And then we can run the garbage collector to give back memory. And that might be um, a scavenge or a local collect to be able to give back um, a small amount of memory. Or it might be, depending on the, the heuristics we've enabled, a full global collect that will really compress your heap and, and compact your heap and, and be get ready to give back more memory. Now, the interesting thing is if your application gives back memory and you're running on a, a node that has some level of constraints around the memory that's available, something else on that node can pick it up and, and use that memory instead. And so you, you start to get some better uh, collaboration out of the JVM when you're running multiple ones on a single server because of this idle tuning that you get out of the box. Um, there are some additional options to be able to really fine tune this and, and to control the behavior more. Um, if you search for uh, the option on the screen, the idle tuning GC on idle option, you should find uh, the doc reference with all the details in it. Okay, so that's just a, a quick whirlwind of some of the things we do out of the box to give you a better container experience and a better cloud experience. But we also do a lot with OpenJ9 to optimize startup. Uh, this is a slide I, I have stolen from somebody else on my team. But the data is based on uh, performance data on the Eclipse.org OpenJ9 website. The link is in the bottom corner there. And what it says is that in a typical workload, uh, 
you know, you expect a 66% smaller footprint doing nothing else. You expect a 42% faster startup, three times faster um, to peak performance in a constrained environment, and the same throughput. So what we typically tell people is that you're going to get about half the memory footprint of um, any other JVM when you run OpenJ9. And that's just, you get that out of the box. It's the way that we've focused on memory usage with OpenJ9 over the years, um, going back in our heritage to being an embedded JVM where memory and, and memory footprint was really critical. Um, and we've seen people, you know, you know, not believe our, our comments on this and, and go off and try and measure this and come back and report that they're getting the same kind of uh, footprint improvements as well. So, I, you know, I, I'm pretty confident in that 50% of the, the memory. Um, but I'm not going to dig much into the, the memory improvements. That's something worth checking out just on its own. But let's talk a little bit about the startup. Now, in order to get startup, we have to talk a little bit about uh, something that we use to drive that startup. And that's, that's called the shared or share classes cache. And the history of this is we looked at um, we looked at C and, and C runtimes and said, hey, wait a minute, when I go to run a C application and it's got a bunch of shared libraries, I load those shared libraries into memory once. And then I reuse that uh, executable code across all the processes that use that shared library. I don't have to pay for one copy of the executable code in every um, program that's going to run it, right? Otherwise, there'd be no point in shared libraries. Well, in Java, you're kind of in that world where you do have to pay for a copy of the code, the byte code, in every, uh, in every JVM that's going to be running it. And so what we've done is we've looked at how class files work and said, well, these are really not an ideal format for a JVM to work with. Uh, the class file is very variable sized. Um, there's no fixed easy offsets in a class file. Um, in order to find a piece of data, you either have to start at the, the start of the class file and walk your way through it each time, or you have to build some kind of structure on top of the class file to give you the data you want. And so what we decided to do was to take that class file and convert it into a format that's more friendly to a JVM to execute. And we call that a ROM class. That ROM class has all the data that the class file has, or at least the pieces that are necessary for um, a JVM to execute. But it's throw away some of the redundant information in that class file. And it's organized and laid out in a way that, that's much friendlier to the JVM. Additionally, it's ROM. So that means that once it's been created, no one will ever write to it again. So you know that you know, it's safe to be able to share because once it's created, no one is going to modify it. Uh, we've also been very careful in designing the format to make it position independent. So you can pick that ROM class up and put it anywhere in memory and still be able to have a valid um, ROM class to work with. Now, for a JVM to, to execute and to execute well, the symbolic data isn't enough. It still needs to be able to cache data, right? When you run a bytecode like the LDC bytecode to get a new string, um, you still need somewhere to hold on to that object. And so we call that the J9 class or the RAM class. And it acts basically as a cache for the values that, uh, that your program generates throughout its run. Now, if you look at, at a single server that's running uh, three JVMs, uh, and they're you know, running on the same JVM, and they're either running the same application, or at least the same class libraries. There are a lot of classes that are going to be loaded in each of those JVMs that are identical. They're going to have exactly the same code. Now, they're going, at, at least in the ROM classes. The RAM classes are going to have uh, JVM-specific data in them. So when we cache a result, that result's going to be specific to a given JVM. But that bottom row of ROM classes all of that is going to be the same. And so we can treat those the same way that C treats its DLLs or its shared libraries. And we can create what we call the shared classes cache. Uh, and so as I've been saying, this cache is basically the equivalent of a, um, a shared library that gets created at runtime. 
So as the JVM executes, it's able to save away these ROM classes that it's created so that they can be used by any other JVM that has access to the cache and has the same classes. We have a bunch of heuristics to make sure that you're getting the class you expect and, and not something else. Um, but what that means is you go from paying for n copies of that memory to only paying for one copy of it. And that gives you a slightly faster startup. We found that um, employing something like the share classes cache can give you a, um, a 10 to 20% uh, footprint improvement just from using the cache. Um, but it also gives you a minorly faster startup just because you don't have to do that conversion from class file to ROM class. Now, JVM engineers tend to be a lazy bunch. Once we have a tool, we're always looking for other ways to be able to do it. And we're always looking for ways to avoid redoing work. And so one of the ways that we've been able to do that in OpenJ9 is through something we call dynamic AOT or dynamic ahead of time compiled code. And the way that works is as the JIT compiler runs and it, it generates code, we save that code away into this cache so that it can be used by other JVMs that access this cache. Or it can be used by um, this same JVM the next time that it starts. And all it, all it takes to enable this is a very single, simple um, dash X share classes option. So what makes that, um, that AOT code faster? Well, what we really have is um, this distinction between a cold one run and a warm run. So the first time you go to run your application, the JVM wants to save away that JIT compiled code to reuse in the next run. And so we call that first run a cold run where the JVM is saving those classes away. It's saving the JIT compiled code away to make the, the second run or the next run, the one we call the warm run faster. And the reason that the dynamic AOT code is faster is that we've written it in a relocatable format. We can't run it directly out of the cache because there are uh, values that need to be embedded in it to make it specific to the JVM you're running in. But doing those relocations and, and those load fix-ups is about 100 times faster than doing a JIT compilation. And so even with the bit of work that you have to do, you're still getting faster startup out of this because you've been able to use that AOT code and you're getting out of the interpreter into the AOT code faster. Um, and we're able to then recompile that code later if it turns out that it's one of the areas that's a hotspot because we're able to save away the metadata that drove that compilation in the first place so we know uh, how to make the right choices when we're trying to recompile that code for a, a faster startup or for a, a, a hotspot in your application. All right, so this is really cool. We've been able to build basically shared libraries at runtime out of the JVM as normal operation. And, and that gives us this shared class with AOT code in it. And we said, look, this is really cool. It takes one option to enable. So what we've done is we said, we're going to enable this by default, at least for boot class path classes. So anything that you know ships with the JDK or is on that boot class path, we're going to cache that for you by default. So you're get a faster startup when you're running with OpenJ9 on your development machine or, or on whatever server you've deployed it on. Um, but it's still worth enabling it explicitly because then you get the full benefits. So we're able to give you a little bit of the benefit out of the box. If you enable it explicitly, you get all of it, the benefit. Um, and that additional benefit comes from the URL class loader subclasses. So by default, any class loader that's a subclass of URL class loader is something we can save that cached data away for. But um, what we've had to do is disable it when running in a container. Um, and the reason we do that is a cache is only valuable if it's going to persist. Right, a cache that you're never going to reuse is of no use to you. And so in a container, what you end up with is every run is that first cold run. Um, because when you go to boot your JDK up, if there's no um, existing shared class cache sitting there, there's nothing for us to use. We would start, we would create a cache and we would start filling it. And that would slow down your application. 
So to make life easy for you, if you haven't explicitly enabled shared classes, we will disable the default cache when you're running in a container. Trying to, to bring down some of that complexity in the experience of running in the cloud. Now, that helps a little bit, but we really do want to take advantage of the shared classes cache in Docker. But the cache and Docker don't always play nice together. And so we, we've had to do some, uh, some interesting changes in this and, and introduce a little bit more complexity back in to be able to give you a better experience when using the cache. So um, with Docker, each layer, in, uh, each layer that's created in your Docker file um, is immutable once it's been created. So when you, if you're familiar with Docker files, um, sets of commands in there are sort of grouped together and, and that grouping of commands, each one creates a new layer. Um, and you typically have a layer for your operating system. You might have a layer that has your JVM in it, OpenJ9 in this case. You might have a layer that has your framework, uh, Open Liberty in this example, and then maybe your application in, in this in this example, the application that I'm adding in that top layer is DayTrader, which is a standard benchmark that we use. So with Docker, each set of containers or each set of commands in your Docker file creates a new layer. Um, and those layers are immutable. And this is actually really good because it means you can reuse those layers. And it's only the, the layers that are changing that you have to pull again. So when you're trying to move uh, Docker images around the network, what you really want is to be able to send that image somewhere and then only pull the small delta that's actually changed. And so Docker layers and their immutability once they're created is really good for that. Now, when you go to actually run the process, all of these layers get collapsed down and it's only files that are visible that actually are available. So, so this is really about um, network transfer and creation of images. When we go to create something like a shared classes cache in that, uh, you know, maybe we create a, a cache at the bottom layer with your JVM and we want to ship that around to anyone using that, uh, that Docker image that has a, a OpenJI in it. But when you go to add your application on or your application framework on top of that, uh, you want to add um, new data for your framework. So, you know, I've got my shared classes cache turned on. I load the existing cache and then I want to add any new data to it. Well, Docker works with copy on write. So any file you modify from a lower layer, you get a, cop a complete copy of that file in your layer. Um, and so this is something to be aware of even outside of shared classes, caches and, and anything else, but files that you modify in Docker um, image creation or in during your Docker build, you may be ending up with multiple copies of those files in the final image. You get sort of one per layer. So just something to be aware of in general. But what we see is I'm paying for my data multiple times in this, right? Uh, I add my application layer, and now I've got three copies of that base data. I've got two copies of my Liberty data, and I've got one copy of my day trader data. Not really the story I wanna have, right? multiple copies of the same data. That means that, that my image is too big. It's gonna slow down my network transfer. I'm paying for that, uh, that data to move around the network and that may slow down my ability to scale. Well, that's, you know, none of those things are things that I want. So how do I solve this? Well, what we had to do was we had to make our shared classes cache aware of the layers that it's working with. So when we start with that open J9 layer, with a shared classes cache in it, um, and we've added data to that. When I add the next layer on top of that, uh, in this case, my Liberty layer, and I go to put new data into that shared classes cache, I create a new cache on top of that. And now my cache becomes layered. And so each layer of that cache is aware of the cache that's underneath it. And the reason for this is to make sure that they're able to reuse data from previous layers and keep that previous layer uh, consistent. So the, the open liberty layer cache knows about all the data in the um, open J9 layer cache. And so if it wants to add new AOT code, even if it's for a class that's from the lower layer, that's fine. It can do that and add that code in its own layer without buying another copy 
of the, the entire cache. And so I can do that for all the layers up my stack and I end up with a much smaller image, which is you know the goal I was looking for. Um, and so this is available in OpenJ9 since our 0.17 release, which shipped in October of 2019. And you, and you can pick that up for Java 8, 11, and it was 13 at the time, now it's 14. Um, as of September, it'll be 15. Um, but what this means is it, it becomes a world where you can build these multi-layered shared classes caches to get the benefits of Docker and those immutable layers and, and only having to push the things that have changed and the benefits of the shared classes cache, that small size, that um, fast startup without making your images really big. Now, I started this talk by talking about the complexity in the cloud and you know the size of that landscape and, and how this is sort of a harder world to navigate and OpenJ9 is focused on the cloud and, and trying to make life easier. And it is, but we end up in this position where there's a certain amount of complexity inherent in the problem. And we haven't been able to, to find a better way to shrink that complexity yet. Uh, though we're always on the lookout for, for ideas. Um, and so what I'll show you here is some of the command line options that you can use to create uh, those layers. So it's X shared classes and you can say, cool and create layer. And that tells the shared classes cache, oh, find the cache that I know about um, or use an option to name a, an explicit cache and create a new layer on top of that. Um, and that's sort of the default way that, that we'd expect people to be using this. Now, we did find when we started trying to put this into production that there were some cases where uh, when creating a new layer on a Docker image, um, the application would run Java multiple times. And if we told it X shared classes create layer, it might create two or three layers of shared classes cache in one Docker layer. And so we added this way to say, look, the second option, uh, layer equals number, to let you sort of specify everything that's going on in this particular layer um, or in this particular set of commands shares a cache layer. Um, it's to help make it easier to, to batch a set of jobs into a single layer. Um, and this ensures that you're only getting one layer created per, uh, per set of commands. Right, so I've been saying OpenJ9 is there to make life easier on the cloud, but what we've looked at is in most applications, the way that their Docker containers are getting built is during their CI CD pipeline. And so yes, there is a bit of complexity in this story, but it, it's something that you can bury into your uh, CI CD pipeline and sort of hide the complexity that has to be created. So you're able to build that base layer um, when you pull your JDK and you know, maybe you start your JDK as part of that Docker file and it builds the, the base layer for you that has the bootstrap classes in it. And then in your framework layer, you, you might uh, build the next layer of your Docker file or build a Docker uh, image that builds on top of the previous layer and it builds its own new cache there. And then the next layer of your pipeline might add the application layer and it can build on the previous cache. And, and so when you get to the final end of this and you're ready to do the testing, you've got your uh, multi-layered shared classes cache built into your, your image from uh, all the steps that came along your pipeline. So uh, there's a pretty natural way to, to embed this. And you know we do have a proof of concept for this. We've seen that the Open Liberty team was able to embrace this and, and get a lot of benefits out of using this. They've been able to get um, small, uh, container images and it's been a uh, you know the shared classes cache improvements have been a major uh, step along their way to the a sub one second uh, startup for a full Jakarta EE app server so that's a you know a pretty impressive point and we've been able to to see that the technology we're building into openj9 is helping those kinds of applications in the cloud now when I say you can do this, the benefits of doing it this way are actually um, something you can multiply across the different CI CD pipeline lines you have, right? If you build your JDK image in, in one base pipeline that, or one base stage that's shared across 
the different frameworks that you might be building. You might be able to build two different frameworks that share the same JDK layer. And uh, so you've got sort of a common image there with a common set of classes and the framework layers each have their own cache in there. And then, you know, the set of applications you might be building on top of that have their set of layers. And, and finally, you do the testing for each of those. But we can see that the layers, as you build them up, follow along with the different pieces and, and you can reuse that across different stages in your pipeline. So I won't try and pretend that this is simple, um, but it's the simplest story we've been able to find that gives you that the real good, the real benefits you want out of something like the shared classes cache um, in a reasonable way. So there is some complexity here, but it's sort of a manageable complexity as you start to build it into your uh, your pipelines. All right, so that's an awful lot about the shared classes cache. Uh, I see there's a question here. Uh, so the question was, can you use this to optimize your CI pipeline too? Um, yes. Uh, if your CI pipeline is, is building on top of uh, a shared classes cache and is reusing that cache or is if your CI pipeline is running Java, my, you can definitely use. My question about that is more um, so about like the pipeline itself. Like if you, you know, like if you're using Jenkins or anything else that's written in Java, is there any like um, benefit you can use to that um, for sharing um, in a CI pipeline, maybe within the various agents, like, or maybe more generally speaking, does this have any benefits for like net, like networked caching? Yes. Um, so we, we've been working with the Jenkins community around uh, getting them to deploy on OpenJ9 because they've been seeing uh, a lot of these same kinds of benefits with um, running their agents. So that, you know, there's definitely uh, benefits there. And also using this kind of caching technique, whether it's for um, any Docker image or, or anything you're pushing around the network, um, will improve the startup and, and help uh, decrease the memory footprint. So you know, we've definitely seen improvements both from the application you're building and just its use in the CI pipeline itself. So, okay. All right, so that's an awful lot about shared classes caches and the kinds of benefits you can get out of that. Um, but that's not the only thing that OpenJ9 does for startup. Um, recently, I've been a little surprised at the amount of issues and, and things I've seen that have specify dash x um, verify none. As somebody who worked on the, the bytecode verifier for a number of years, this is my least favorite option ever because it turns off all the safety belts in the JVM and you don't know what's going to happen when you go to run that code anymore. You've really uh, sort of taken your life in your own hands and, and removed all the air bags out of your car, taken the seat belts out, taken the seats out, and, and you know who knows what you're going to crash into. But we know why people do this. People do this because they want their application to start fast. Now, the reason they need to do this to get fast startup is not so much the verification algorithm itself, but the class loading that verification brings. Um, so if we look at the small snippet of code that I'm showing here, we see a method called accept C. Uh, it's got the red arrow pointing at it, and I'm passing it an instance of B. And I see that that method takes an instance of C. So one of the things the verifier has to do is um, validate that the things being passed around are, um, are compatible. So the verifier is making sure as it walks the bytecode that nobody's underflowing the stack and nobody's overflowing the stack and that all the types are compatible. And the way it does that at times is loading those classes. And it loads those classes to check that the two things are the same, or at least could be reasonably assigned to each other. So we added something we call the class relationship verifier. Um, it also shipped in version 17 of uh, 0.17 of OpenJ9. So it's uh, available in, in any image that you pull from, uh, or any binary you pull from Adopt OpenJDK today. Um, and what this does is it records those relationships rather than validating them at the time that it sees them. So rather than, than checking um, 
whether B and C are compatible by loading all their classes and their super classes and the interfaces they implement and, and validating that there's a, um, that you can compatibly assign a B to a C. Um, what it does is it just records that it saw this. And then it um, will later check that relationship when those classes would naturally be loaded by your application. So the benefit of this is there's a whole bunch of classes typically get referred to by your application and never get loaded. Um, these are things like exceptions that may never be thrown, but you talk about in a, um, in a uh, try catch block. Well, the, the verifier has to validate that the thing you're catching actually is an exception. So it might force the class to be loaded. It might be that you only call one method from this class and it's got a bunch of other methods that refer to classes you're never going to care about in your application. By default, the verifier has to load all those classes and validate them. When you use our class relationship verifier, we just record the relationships and we'll check them when your program actually forces the classes to be loaded, if it ever does. A lot of applications, um, you'll find that you don't load these classes and so you get a, a pure win out of this. See that there's a, another question here, so. Um, so the question was, how does the caching scheme compare to class data sharing and application class data sharing in OpenJDK? Uh, so this was a question around the shared classes cache, and it's a similar idea. Um, my understanding about the class data sharing in, in OpenJDK is that you provided a list of classes and it builds that data structure ahead of time. And so it, it there, you're giving it a whole list of classes that it, you want to have it to preload or pre-build for you. And it's able to do that um, based on the list that you've provided. Um, in our case, it's purely dynamic. We will just recognize the classes as they get loaded and cache them away for you. Um, we also do the AOT code um, that gets shared away. And I don't believe that uh, that Hotspot does that as part of their class data sharing. So they take a similar approach, but it's um, the way that you build their data structures is um, somewhat different. Um, it, it's less automatic for you. It, it, it requires more manual effort and it doesn't have the, uh, the AOT benefits. Okay. So if you're ever tempted to use dash X verify none, check out uh, this class relationship verifier instead. And we actually have uh, another piece of this that that's under review right now that we're working on getting added in that, that makes the improvements even greater. Um, and I just realized I don't have the, the number on the slide, but I think we get about 70% of the improvement uh, that you would get from verify none when you use the class relationship verifier. So you get almost all of the speed up and you get to keep the safety. So worth checking out. Oh, that's some of the things that OpenJ9 brings um, sort of out of the box for containers. It's some of the things OpenJ9 brings um, to make your application start faster, never mind the sort of half the memory you're going to spend just because you used OpenJ9. So, you know, you, you get a bunch of benefits out of OpenJ9, but we're also looking at ways to innovate and make your cloud experience even better. And so one of those areas we've been looking at is microservices. Um, so microservice deployments often mean that you're deploying your application, um, the same application, and you're scaling it out, right? That's one of the, the great things about microservices is that you can scale them independently based on the amount of work and, and load that you have coming in. And so when you scale your application or you scale your series of microservices, each one of those has a full JVM in it it's got a JIT compiler in it. And that JIT compiler is going to compile the same classes over and over and over again. So you're going to compile string. You're going to compile object. You're going to compile class. You're going to compile your frameworks classes. You're going to compile your application classes over and over and over again in each one of those instances. And to do that, your JIT compiler uses a lot of memory. If you've uh, ever used GCC or, or Clang, or any of the other 
uh, native compilers, they take a lot of memory and they tend to be slow to compile your code. Well, in a JVM with a JIT compiler, uh, we can't be slow. We sort of have this, it has to be fast, um, but we still need a, a fairly large amount of memory to be able to do that compilation because we have to build that program, that representation of your program um, to be able to operate over it. But, you know, if we're deploying the same kinds of code and the same microservice and, and scaling it out, maybe we could take that JIT out of the process. Maybe we could save that 100 megs of uh, memory that would be used to do those compilations. You know, what kind of world would that look like? So what if we were able to make that JIT into a server? Um, and so we didn't just remove it out of the process, but maybe we put a, an orchestrator in front of it that did load balancing and affinity and, and all the things that you expect out of a service. And then we had backend JIT servers behind that that did the actual compilation for you. So your application would run like it normally does, and it would identify the methods to compile. And then it would say, uh, you know, JIT server, JIT server, please compile this for me. And the JIT server and the client would have a conversation and they, you know, discuss what classes had been loaded and what profiling data the client had and what the environment was like. And then the JIT server would do the compilation and it would send back the code and all the metadata that was required so that the client could install it in its code cache and start to make use of it, right? What would that world look like? What would that do for our applications? Well, first off, it would um, really reduce the amount of CPU and memory that are being used at the client. So if you look down in the corner here, I'm showing um, two runs of OpenJ9. The orange line is the JIT server which has a nice flat footprint profile uh, across the run. And the other is a typical OpenJ9 client. And we see that during startup, you get these nice memory spikes as the JIT compiler runs and has to compile the code that you, you know, your application wants. But you know, we should be able to do this with no loss in performance because we're using this same profiles, the same class hierarchy analysis. Uh, we're still adaptable if the conditions change, so we can still make speculative optimizations and, and fall back if they fail. And we're still the platform neutral in the same way. We don't have to have pre-compiled the binary to be able to do this. You know, can this actually work? And the answer is yes, very nicely. Um, so what I'm showing here is Acme Air, which is a fairly standard um, cloud benchmark. Uh, using Java, and, and I'm running that with a shared classes cache, both a cold run and a warm run on a fairly constrained uh, system. So it has only one processor and it only has about 150 megs of memory. And what we see is that cold run where we're filling up that shared classes cache, the JIT server is able to start and ramp up much quicker than the standard OpenJ9 client. And then in the case where we have the caches, so the the uh, the graph labeled warm run, we see that um, we get that fast ramp up for both of them, um, but the JIT server is able to ramp up a little faster. So uh, these measurements were done using a, a hardwired connection between the clients and the servers. Um, but we've also been able to replicate these results in, in more cloud-based environments as well. And I'll just note here that Hotspot takes about twice as long as OpenJ9 in these workloads to, to ramp up to the same performance level. Um, so here's showing similar graphs, but again, showing that the more we can constrain the environment, the bigger the benefit you get out of that JIT server. Um, because when you use that JIT server, your application is, is um, in a constrained environment. If you don't have a JIT server, your application and the JIT are competing for the fairly small amount of memory that's available. And so as you can shrink that amount of memory and offload the JIT compilation out of process, you're able to pack more instances together. And so we're seeing even in these fairly constrained uh, environments like that one CPU with 200 mega memory, we're still getting good throughput, and we're able to do that while offloading the JIT compilation elsewhere. 
Okay, so, but what about network latency? Won't that actually hurt your startup and your ramp up? Is this actually practical in a cloud? Um, and we've done these experiments on AWS and gotten the same kinds of results there. We're seeing the same uh, low footprint, the same good uh, throughput and ramp up. So you know, our belief is that this does actually work and, and does scale. All right, so that sounds like a, a great pitch, but hopefully you're interested enough to pick this up and, and give it a try. And the code for the JIT server is fully open sourced in the Eclipse Open J9 project. Um, it, we've been shipping this in as a tech preview in the Adopt Open J, JDK builds as of January of this year. So if you want to pick up JDK 8 or 11 it, on x86, you're going to be able to play around with the JIT server. The way to run the JIT server is it's you know basic client server. So there's uh, the command line options in the middle of the, the page here. Uh, to run the server, you run JIT server, you give it the port and the, the address. And when you run your client, you say, hey, please use the JIT server. There's my port and, and my address and, and the application you're going to run. What we'd love to hear is people pick this up, try it out, and tell us about it. We want to find out how well it's worked in your environments, what kinds of things um, have worked well for you, and any places where you may have found an issue along the way. Um, we'd like to work through that with you and, and figure out how that works and how to make the JIT server work in the best possible way as you try to do these cloud deployments. And so this is one of the areas that we are looking at um, improving and, and continuing to drive innovation in OpenJ9. And this is really just the beginning, right? So far, we've focused on moving that JIT compilation um, to the server, and we've got that working. And now, uh, you know, as we continue to tune that, we're starting to think about what other things we can do now that we have that server in place. You know, maybe that's work more efficiently across a cluster of, of JVMs. If we can recognize that this microservice is the same as that microservice, we can give you all the code that we compiled for the other one. Um, you know, maybe we can do something around categorizing clients so we can help figure out how to deploy them better or optimize groups of microservices together. Uh, we're early days of thinking of all the potential of what we can do with this, but there's a lot there and we'd love to, to have everybody join in and, and connect with us around this. So if you're thinking, this sounds really good, I, I want to check it out. Uh, the place to get binaries is the Adopt Open JDK project. Uh, if you don't know about Adopt Open JDK, it's a really cool project put together by the London Java user community. Uh, they looked at Open JDK and said, this is great, but it's kind of hard to get a, a good Open JDK binary. Um, one where you can see how it's been tested, one where you can see um, all the tests being run and, and everything that goes into making this binary. And so they created a project based around being able to build JVMs and be a central clearinghouse for getting JDKs and, and JDK binaries. Um, and so, you know, check out Adopt if you want to download the OpenJ9 builds, uh, select the OpenJ9 binary. They also have uh, a set of uh, Docker images on Docker Hub that you can download as well. And they're constantly building um, all the new new releases as well as all the LTS releases. So it's a lot of information here, but hopefully, um, you know, we've been able to look at, at that cloud landscape and simplify some of the issues you've had to work with, some of the issues in adopting Java, in adopting containers, and been able to, to show you some new and, and cool techniques to make your Java applications run better in the cloud and, and to show you that even in the cloud, it's always sunny with OpenJ9. So, uh, and uh, so at this point, I guess I'm gonna open things up for, for more questions. Um, so there's a question here around the suggested way to share uh, classes between containers. And uh, volumes is definitely one answer. If you look at the um, Adopt Open JDK Docker Hub page for the OpenJ9 uh, section, you can see um, examples of how to use Docker volumes uh, to share classes between containers. So there's uh, some examples uh, in the documentation there, but that's definitely uh, the easiest way to do it. Um, have we benchmarked? 
footprint and start up against Micronaut and other AOT approaches. Um, we actually love Micronaut. Uh, both Micronaut and Quarkus, uh, we think are really cool. And, and both of them take a, a, a similar approach to being able to um, do a bunch of work at build time rather than doing it at runtime. And that works really well with our shared classes caches and with the way that uh, OpenJ9 works. And so when we're running as the JVM for Micronaut or for Quarkus or any of those frameworks that do a bunch of the uh, the ahead of time level compilation at the Java level, uh, you really get a bunch of the improvements out of OpenJ9 from that. So you, you'll find that uh, your Micronaut workload starts up really fast and really well when running on OpenJ9 with a, a shared classes cache. Um, so a question around um, security of the JIT server. So the, the design that we've been looking at right now has been that the JIT server is going to de be deployed in your Kubernetes pod, uh, sorry, in your Kubernetes cluster. And so you own the cluster, you own both the server and the clients, and you would only expose um, the server to your own clients. You wouldn't make it publicly accessible. And so the security implications are only within your own set of applications. Uh, we haven't looked at making it a um, actual service uh, that would be that would live outside of of your realm of applications, because then you know, as you imply here, the security implications go way up. Um, has OpenJ9 been tested with application servers, and do you recommend it for monolithic applications running on production environments? Uh, yeah, so OpenJ9, uh, we've tested, um, we test, I work for IBM, and so um, we test a lot with Open Liberty and with the Liberty App Server. Um, historically, the J9 code base has run underneath of uh, traditional um, WebSphere application server as well. Um, and it, with our testing at Adopt Open JDK, we've seen it run with um, a wide range of application servers. So definitely not just for microservices, your, your standard application servers all benefit from uh, the same kind of improvements that, that everyone gets with OpenJ9. Question about the name. And the, so the question is, does J9 refer to Java 9? And the answer is no. Um, J9 is, the name is very old. It goes back to our small talk days. The old um, IBM Visual Age small talk or NV small talk, all of the classes in small talk were called K8 something. And the reason for that was that the small talk VM fit within 8K and small talk didn't allow you to start a class name with a number. And so all the classes were 8K and when we switched from doing small talk to doing Java, um, the team saw that you know moving from small talk to Java had some benefits, uh, and so you know from eight to nine. But it also was a regression in some ways because they really liked small talk uh, better than they liked Java, and so they they changed from K to J, and they changed from eight to nine, and so the name really has nothing to do with Java releases some history that we really should have uh, gotten rid of before we went open source. But um, Java, J OpenJ9 is able to run multiple releases of, of Java, both Java 8 and 11 and whatever the, the current uh, feature releases. Does the JIT server contain just the one cache for all the clients that connect to the instance? Um, so the JIT server doesn't actually contain a cache right now. Um, the way the JIT server works is uh, any shared class caches live on the client. Um, and when that client and the server have a, a conversation, um, it caches a bit of the, the questions that it's asked that client so it doesn't have to keep asking the same questions over and over. And it caches that information uh, per client. Uh, but the share, in terms of the shared classes cache, um, that's, uh, that only lives on the client. It doesn't live at the server. All right. Well, thank you so much, Mary, for and yeah. Matt for having me on and, and for letting me uh, join your drug today. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dan. Yeah.